Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship today. It's lovely to hear um, the buzz of conversation. Um, we're really glad that you can join us this morning in person, and a very special welcome to those of you who will join us later online. Um, also, a very special welcome to the Reverend Graham Connor this morning. Um, it's lovely to have you back with us. But perhaps this morning, um, could we just take a minute? Could we take a minute and greet the people beside you, behind you, in front of you, and just say hello. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Do you know, I don't know about you, but maybe sometimes we feel, and I certainly do even this morning, that we haven't time to breathe. We rush from one thing to another in our daily lives. And unfortunately, I'm going to suggest this morning that sometimes spills out. Even when we come in to church, we have to see about a meeting that's going to happen during the week. We have to make sure the door, door is open, very important. And um, the coffee pots are ready. The music not quite sure about the organist, but the music is in working order. The technology is up and running. All really important things with everyone playing a role, but please never at the detriment of spending time together, and more importantly, spending time with God, because that's why we are here this morning. And we often joke in our house, and I'm sure in your house as well, you walk into church and people go, how are you? Fine, everything's fine when everything's not fine and everything's not going well. We've got to be open and honest with each other. And hopefully this morning, you can have that chance to be open and honest with, with God. Not with me, not with Graham, but with God. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, we read, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Notice that scripture says we don't just have some plans, we have many plans. Now, maybe some of your plans for this afternoon or the week ahead are running through your heads right now as I speak. I have plans too. I have to-do lists, and I have to-do lists made about to-do lists. Memos full of ideas of things I want to try, books I want to read, and goals I would love to accomplish. And at times it can be frustrating knowing that I don't have enough time or more recently enough energy to pursue every plan that comes to heart. And of course there is no guarantee that we'll see our plans come to pass perfectly. So my plan of lying for two weeks in an all-inclusive Caribbean resort might be a stretch or maybe not. I don't know, okay? This often leaves us with the sting of what feels like failure when our many plans remain in our planners or scribbles in our journals. But let's look at that differently this morning. What if we choose to look at our unaccomplished or interrupted plans not as failures, but as opportunities? What if God is using what we call failed plans for his greatest purpose? Unfulfilled plans are often pathways to God's greater purpose. When our focus is on God's purpose over our plans, we are then freed from the pressure they create. We release the urge to do everything at once and the frustration when we realize we can't. So this morning, let's park the plans just to the side for the next hour or so. So try to focus on what our Heavenly Father wants to say to you this morning in the here and now. Let us pray. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. We're going to stand this morning and sing our first praise, which is Cornerstone. Thank you. 
Let us pray. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. righteousness. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Saviour's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. Father God, what awesome words of reassurance we have just been singing. That no matter what each head bowed here this morning faces, you are with us. The God who created the universe and planned everything as it should be has the same desire to direct our plans, to fashion and shape us into men and women of God. Lord, this morning we pray that you would give us willing hearts to respond to the call that you have for each of our lives. But we admit, Father, that there have been times recently when we have ignored the prompting of your Holy Spirit and done our own thing, only to realize that we've actually made things worse. Instead of following your will, Ours seems so much better. Instead of turning to you for guidance and direction, we look to others. Instead of looking at what your word had to say about our particular situation, we again ignored it and tried to sort it out for ourselves. And rather than making you our priority this week, we actively chose to leave you out. Father, in the quietness of this place, 
we confess our sin of preoccupation with worldly stuff. That will never bring us the fulfillment we could have in you. Time spent on an iPad, time watching the television, all precious, Lord, in some way or another, but have kept us from being with you. Lord, we also confess that at times we just find this life tough. It's tough going. And when circumstances threaten to overwhelm us, help us to look up to you. Only you know our hearts. And as we meet as your people today, help us to be honest, maybe for the first time, about our current relationship with you. If it's going well, then just help us to praise you appropriately. If it's a little cold, help us find a way back to you. And if it's just weary, Lord, restore us. Help us, Lord. Amen. There are a number of announcements this morning. Um, just to let the Kirk session know that we're meeting at half seven on Tuesday night. And one from... Husband McKeown, Saturday the 4th of March at 7.30 p.m. There will be a concert affiliated with Music at McQuiston, which will be the renewed faith group that were here just prior to Christmas. But this time the focus is on old gospel songs and their own original songs. Uh, Mark would like to know if you intend to go. Obviously you come in, it's free to come in, but you have to pay to get out. There's a recommended donation there of five pounds. And Mark would like to know if you intend to go because he would like to sort the tea, coffee and Becky's. So if you would let him know about that. All the other announcement sheets are on, or all the other announcements are on the announcement sheet. I uh, suppose I should draw your attention to the footers list. Could you please check it? And if you think that your name's missing or had been omitted, then you should speak to Kendall Breath or Joan Gardner. Thank you very much. That, that seems to be it. Um, we're going to stand and sing another piece. It's a relatively new piece to our congregation, um, King of Kings by Hillsong. But throughout this song, maybe if you would just look at, at how it flows, it outlines God's plan for humanity. Let us stand and sing King of Kings.
This morning we're just going to take a couple of minutes and reflect on where we have been so far on our messy church journey and Tim is just going to play a video so have a wee look for yourselves in this. Can you guess who made the video? The clues in the shoes. <laughs> Thank you, Kerry. Many, many thanks. I couldn't do anything like that. So this morning, we just want to give you a wee bit of an update on what's going on with Messy Church. As you can tell from the video, there, there, there must be people who enjoy it because they come back time after time. Um, and just before lockdown, if we can all remember back to then, we were actually in the throes of organizing our Easter Messy Church. And little did we know back then what was going to happen. But guess what? I'm here this morning and I'm delighted to tell you all that the date has been set. Easter Messy Church will take place on Sunday the 2nd of April 2023. It'll actually be on Palm Sunday. I hope I've got my dates right. And that's when we're going to be having our next Messy Church. Now, if you haven't been before, why not? What's holding you back? Why have you not been? We would love to see you there. You're maybe sitting there this morning thinking, right, all I saw up there is a bunch of people eating food and having fun and all the rest of it. Yeah, that's what it's about. Messy church is a fun way of doing church. Not that we don't have fun every week, but it's a fun way of doing church and helps people encounter Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's not a substitute to normal church. It's just a different way of doing it. It uses hands-on activities to explore Bible stories, to reflect a God of creativity, and to give people a chance to come together and enjoy hospitality and fellowship. And that probably, for me, is one of the highlights of it, to be able to sit, to talk, and to spend time in each other's company. Messy Church does not, you're right, follow the traditional Sunday service format. It is slightly more casual and interactive, I wish I could wear that Christmas tree outfit every week to church, but I can't. 
Over the last two sessions, we've also introduced Vintage Church for our more young at heart members is the way that I would put it, and it has been a great success. God has blessed this work to date, and as a church family, we owe him a lot of thanks. Every messy church has been financially supported by members of the congregation. I haven't had to go to Tim and ask for a check, and he's very happy about that. So thank you. You know who you are. Thank you very much. Many people have prayed for this venture, and without this vital aspect, it just wouldn't work. We have a team of committed people who come to planning meetings to cut, stick, paste, and even learn actions of a new piece of worship. But there's room for more. If you're crafty, in the positive sense, like making things, baking stuff, all the stuff I don't like doing, we need you. If you feel that you would like to lead from the front, let us know. If you would like to be involved in any way, please come and speak to either Kerry or myself. If there's something we're missing and it could be improved upon, let us know. There will be two planning meetings coming up, so watch out for those over the next few weeks. But just before the children go out to Sunday school or M&M kids, we're going to ask Luke to come and pray for Messy Church. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for Messy Church. We thank you that we, that we can have fun learning about you and your love for each one of us. We bless all the work that will go into organizing Easter Messy Church and that our church family will come together to celebrate Easter in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. We're going to join together as we all stand to sing Jesus, all for Jesus. from way up there, isn't it, girls? 
You have a great time. <laughs> well, can I thank Paula and others who help the service, folks up there, folks here, folks at the door. I just love coming here. I keep telling you that, but it's partly because there's so many people who help to uh, just um, help us to worship God here Sunday by Sunday. And I know there's lots of other things going on during the week as well. Um, so it's great to be back with you. And let's just come to God in prayer for a moment or two. And we're thinking particularly of praying for others. <clears throat> we want to thank you, Lord, for the boys and girls here in church this morning, for their families, and pray now that they and those that are with them will enjoy worshiping you and learning together and seeking to follow you today here in McQuiston. We want to think, Lord, of our world that seems so broken. So many of us know people who are seriously ill, people who are struggling to make ends meet, people who are worried and fearful, people who are carrying the burdens of other family members, people who feel under pressure at work. And Lord, we want to pray for our friends that are known to us and some in the congregation unknown to us. You know all about what's going on in each one of our lives. And we remember the lovely words of Jesus who tells us each one to come to him because your yoke is easy, your burden is light. Yes, you give us burdens, Lord. And you help us carry those burdens and even find sometimes joy in those burdens and peace in them. But you somehow lighten that load to know that what we go through is nothing in comparison to what you have gone through in dying on the cross for us. We pray for our broken world. We pray for the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, for the hundreds of thousands of people affected by that, some of them here in Northern Ireland. Give us opportunities to care for them and to love them and support them. We pray, Lord, for those that are on the front line fighting. They'll be fearful. We pray, Lord, that you will minimize the casualties and deaths. And we pray that those in authority will come to their senses, Lord, and seek for peace and justice, that people will be able to come back home and begin to rebuild their lives and their families and communities. We think of the dreadful devastation in Turkey and Syria, Lord. And again, there are people here in Northern Ireland who have lost families, whose homes have been destroyed, whose workplaces and communities have been wiped out. And we cannot take in just the utter devastation and thousands upon thousands of people who have lost their lives and perhaps hundreds of thousands of people who have been bereaved. Lord, please, please pour out your kindness and goodness your comfort that is beyond human comfort. And yet, Lord, as part of your care, we pray that you will send many into that region who will go in your name to bring peace and love and kindness and mercy and above all grace. Our Father, we remember our own political stalemate here and we pray for those involved in sorting out this protocol for our links with our neighbours in Europe, our links within our own country in the United Kingdom, Lord. And we pray men and women whom you've called into politics will seek to go that extra mile as you call us to go in seeking to rebuild our community. We, we pray, Lord, for those who are running businesses with all the uncertainty involved in that and pray that you will intercede and bring a, a way forward. We think of the awful violences, awful um, series of violent deaths that have occurred in our province. It grieves us, Lord, to think that violent men and sometimes women are going about seeking to destroy other people, to maim them for life or worse. Lord, we cry out to you that you would change the hearts and minds of many. We're really asking for revival that would begin in us and around us in our arts, hearts and attitudes, but also in the minds of these who not only think violence, but do it. Lord, please to remember those who are unwell in this congregation. 
those who are struggling to get back to some kind of normal life, those who are dealing with ongoing conditions that are not going to go away. We know that you're the great healer of mind and body and spirit and pray for your healing to come. And remember to the Kirk Sessions it meets this week and continue to lead us through this vacancy to the minister of your choice who will come soon. We thank you, Lord, for so many who serve here and we pray that as another servant of yours comes to be the one who will bring your word to many and encourage and lead, that you will be preparing them already for the task here. And we pray that in the future there will be those in this community that will give thanks for these days within McQuiston and for the days that are yet to come, knowing that many will see and many will fear and put their trust in the Lord and come to fellowship here. Finally, hear our prayers for ourselves, for the things that we put in your place, the idols that we make in our hearts. Lord, help us to cast them aside. For the things that are uppermost in our minds, help us to bring them to you, Lord, to cast our care upon you and know that you do care for us. And We pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you have a better memory than me, you know that I've been looking through the story of Abraham with you when I've been here. And we've got to chapter 15 today. The last time I was here, it was a kind of an unusual story that most of us won't remember, where Abram was involved in a kind of war between two groups of kings. And then at the end of that, he met this strange person called Melchizedek, who was a kind of picture of Jesus for he was a king and he was a priest. And those of us that are older, who know our catechism, know that Jesus was a prophet, a priest, and a king. And we learnt a little bit about Abram there, that he refused the king of Salem, who wanted to give him lots of material things, lots of things that we spend our lives trying to gather up. And instead, he chose to follow the way of Melchizedek and worship the Lord. And chapter 15 is linked to this. We're only going to read six verses today, but they're some of the most significant verses in the whole of the Old Testament. So let us hear God's word. After these things, that's after the war and the worship with Melchizedek, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said... O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir, a servant. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he, Abram, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And we thank God for his word that we'll come back to in a moment. And let's sing together before we come to that passage and think about it. Lord, I come to you. Let's approach God with anticipation that he will give us the spiritual food that we need today. Lord, I come to you. Let's stand. <clears throat>
wonder is that chorus or that song your experience what's it like for you when you read in your bible or you've been to sunday school as a little boy or a girl and someone has shared with you just one of the promises of god and you waited and waited and waited and waited yes and waited and it hasn't happened does your heart soar like a needle sometimes not is not the truth sometimes it does I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the day when Jesus will come back or take me home hasn't happened yet but I'm waiting and promises are important aren't they especially if they come from someone who is a significant person or in this case the promises that God had given to Abram he isn't yet called Abraham that has yet to come and one of those promises was that he would have children grandchildren and great grandchildren and here he is getting old and nothing has happened and he brings his complaint to God these are the first words in the Bible that Abram says O oh Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? We rely on promises, don't we? I have brought all my money with me today. Five pound note. I can barely read it now. I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. You can hardly read it. It's so small even. And uh, that used to be because the Bank of England, it's a Bank of England note. I, I don't even know if Danske and Ulster Bank say that or not. But that was there because the Bank of England held enough gold that if somebody brought uh, a piece of paper like that, they could receive five pounds worth of gold. I think they don't have enough gold now. But the idea is that if you have that, you can go and go to a shop, a merchant or whatever, and pay for goods or services, and that is honored. Or you might have said to somebody in the way, and I, I see there's coffee on Tuesday morning, let's meet up on Tuesday, and it's a kind of a promise. We'll be here in the question Tuesday morning and have a chat and catch up. I can remember very well my aunt and uncle when they emigrated to Canada when I was about eight or nine, and they went with my two cousins, and uh, I can remember all the family went up to the old Nuts Corner Airport. And yes, it's that long ago. And uh, we all said, we waited for hours and hours for the plane to take off, and we all said goodbye, and we thought we'd never see them again. And I can remember my aunt saying to her mother, Look, Mother, when we gather up enough money, we'll come home to see you. And it, we waited, and we waited, and we waited. For years we waited, because they had to find a house, get jobs, look after two boys growing up. It was a long time before my aunt, first of all, and then the family came back to visit here in Northern Ireland, waiting. It's great to have the promises of God, but when we're waiting, sometimes God gives us little helps along the way. Following Jesus is a big, long, interrupted walk, isn't it? That's all it is. And sometimes when we're waiting, it's a bit like, well, we've broken our ankle or we've got arthritis or whatever it might be, and we need a crutch or something to help us along the way. And here's one of the things that God gave to Abram, and he will give to you and to me, things that help us when we're waiting so here's the first thing the struggle over the promise that I've mentioned and isn't it interesting that God stirs up the struggle verse 1 he says to Abram fear not Abram I am your shield your reward shall be very great it's God who raises the conversation after these things we're told Abram had said no to the riches of the kingdom, kingdom of Sodom because he knew that God will ultimately supply his need. Is that how it is for you, for me? We know that God ultimately gives us everything that we have. And sometimes he puts us in that place where we must trust him because we don't have enough. Or maybe he was frightened because it does say, fear not, 
because he thought these kings would come back and defeat him, rearm themselves and take vengeance on him and his family and his servants. Or maybe the fear was that something else was going on in his life and he was frightened about it. Maybe he's just struggling. It seems to be he certainly was struggling with the passage of time and he was worried about the fact that God didn't seem to be fulfilling his promises, keeping them. And the Lord says, fear not. Now, listen, if there's nothing else in this sermon you remember, take that home with you. You're not meant to jump on in the story. Those two words are important for you and me, fear not. Because we do fear, don't we? We fear when something's slightly off with our body and our health isn't good. Or when you get to my age, you can't remember why you went from one room to another to get something. Maybe, maybe there was another reason for it. And you think, is my mind starting to go? Or maybe your friend hasn't been contacting you for a while and you're trying to think, was it something I said or I did the last time we met? All kinds of fears in our lives. And God knows that's the point. And he says to us, you don't need to be afraid. I'm here. And I'm here to help you deal with whatever seems to be the thing that's frightening you. It's not big enough that I can't deal with it and help you to deal with it too. Abram's problem, of course, was the problem of time. As I've read those verses, verses 2 and 3, he says, look, if I were to die tonight, this, this manager, this senior servant of mine, Eliezer, would inherit everything because I don't have any family. That's the way of it. And uh, things were moving on. And he was concerned about God's promise. It was a good concern. He was concerned about the fact that God's promise didn't seem to be happening. The Lord had promised to make him a great nation in chapter 12 and verse 2. He had promised in verse 7 that all this land would be given to Abram's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on. But there's no sign of a descendant yet. Abram's not complaining to God that his life isn't comfortable. In fact, by now, he's quite a wealthy man. By those days' standards, he was very comfortable. No, he's not complaining about possessions and wealth. He wants to see the Lord's saving plan for the world get off the blocks, get going. And nothing seems to be happening. When I was a little boy, this church would have been full. My home church would have been full. This road, like I lived on up the upper Crumlin Road, the Shankill, the Crumlin Road, North Belfast, this road, Craiger Road, all the roads. Sunday morning, people come into church. Even more at a time Sunday night, when people worked six long, hard days, they didn't always get up on a Sunday morning. They came to church at night. We're not longing for that, but aren't we longing that in these communities, Jesus Christ will be honored and people will come to know him? And certainly I'm concerned that that promise doesn't seem to be happening. I feel a bit like Abram. But here's the little ray of encouragement. When you have faith in the Lord Jesus, you have the right to complain to God. Now, if you don't believe me, listen this afternoon, if you have an hour or two, just read through all the Psalms. You can skip 119 if you want, because it's a big, long one. But you can do the rest in an afternoon easily and just list how many Psalms have complaints from the Psalmist to God, and they're in God's Word. Abram has been promised and he wants to bring his difficulties to God and so can we. Abram is caught up on these promises. He wants them. They're special. They're precious and nothing's happening. So Abram brings those questions and bewilderment and impatience and he casts it all at the Lord's feet and only a person of faith can do that. Why, Lord? Why not? Please keep on doing that. God wants to have a conversation with you in your life. He won't give you all the answers now, but he will deepen your trust in him. 
Unbelief spits on promises, you see. Faith struggles over them. Unbelief dismisses God's promises. Faith debates them with God. How can you be the Lord of heaven and earth and let this awful thing happen in Turkey and Syria? How can you do that, Lord? And this struggle over God's word is the pathway to fuller assurance and trust in him. Because I want you to see the sign or the sacrament of assurance that God gives to him in verses 4 and 5. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he took him outside. It was evening, obviously. Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. He gives him a visible sign in the sky. Now, we don't get the full wonder of this. Uh, it wasn't until I went to live in Asia and on a one particular occasion went to a very remote area up in the mountains in the Hindu Kush. And we were out there at night and I saw the sky as I've never seen it in my life because of all the light around Belfast. And even when we go out into the countryside in Northern Ireland, you don't see what's there. If you've never been, go to the planetarium in, in, in Armagh. If you're retired like me, you can go for free. You, know, and you just have to pay to get in, but you can get there and back for free. And Armagh is a nice place to walk around. It's amazing some of the shows there of what they can see beyond our eyes. And Abram looks and hears the confirmation. Every night he looked up at those stars from that night on. He knew that God's promise would come to pass. Now, there's not a logic to it. It's, it, it really, it's about, it's about a, a graphics, if you like. The Lord seems more concerned right here to impress Abram with the promise than simply just say, look, you're going to have lots of family, and that family is going to be a blessing to the world. He gives him a picture, a picture. Now, my wife is a very good cook, and baker. I'm not just saying that in case she's watching at home, but she won't be. But she is. And we have lots and lots and lots of recipe books. Occasionally I look at them. You know. I look at them. Do you know why I look at them? I don't think I've read very many recipes. I love looking at the pictures. Because the pictures show me what something's going to be like. And then, of course, the first time I have it, and it is like that, the picture reminds me of how wonderful it is. Do you get it? Pictures leave an impression. They appeal not just to our minds, but to our imaginations. You can start to lick your lips, start to think of your favorite sweet or meal. And that's what this stargazing, star counting thing is all about. He's taking Abram's imagination. He's enlarging him. And he's saying, here, look up. I want to give you a clue of what it's going to be like. And we are children of Abram. We're, we're if you like, one of those stars in the sky if we believe in the Lord Jesus. And verse 5, I think, is wonderful because it just shows how the Lord is prepared to to reach right down to people like us and humble himself and say, here's another reason why my promise is true. G.K. Chesterton, who among other things wrote the, farmer, uh, the Father Brown stories that you might have seen on television, G.K. Chesterton said, don't believe anything you can't be told in colored pictures. Don't believe anything you can't be told in colored pictures. And in the star sign, God is giving Abram a colored picture, a visual aid to help his faith, to make his promises more sure, to do all that he can to impress Abram to believe in the living God. And he does the same with us, doesn't he? You'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper soon. And when we come to the Lord's Supper on a Sunday or at another time with our wobbly faith on the Lord's Day. It's as if Jesus is saying, here, let me give you a picture to help you go on believing. You see this bread? Well, doesn't it remind you of the bread at home, the bread, the food that you eat that keeps your body alive 
I will keep you spiritually alive. I'll sustain you in any circumstances, wherever you are. How down you feel, how wonderful you feel, I will be the living bread for you. Do you see that wine? If I have done this for you, if I have poured out my life on the cross for you, I will go to any length to hold on to you and to keep you. I will help you in any circumstance that is less than that. Easily do it. No, he doesn't ask us to go out and count the stars. He comes to us through a table and strengthens our faith. But the, the picture's meant of the same effect, isn't it? To make us stronger, to make us surer. Here's the third thing and final thing. Do you notice the sufficiency of faith? Verse 6 is one of those mega verses in the Bible. It's quoted a lot elsewhere in the Old Testament and in the New. And so I want to unpack it a little bit more than the other verses. In the Hebrew, there's actually only five words, but here it is in English. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord he counted it to him as righteousness. Now I'll come to the, what it is about. It's about the character of faith, but let me unpack it. It's such an important verse that people can get right or can get wrong. Do you see the, the form of the verse? The verse is not part of the conversation. If you have a Bible, you'll see there's no, there's no apostrophes around it. It's not part of the conversation between the Lord and Abram. In fact, it's probably not something that Abram was even aware of at that time. It's a comment by the writer of God's word, probably Moses, under the Spirit of God. And then do you notice the translation of it? Really, the verb should say, and he had believed. Or better, if I can word it this way, and he remained, f remained firm in his belief. It's, it's about Abram's prevailing attitude. He remained firm, though his faith was tested in verses 2 and 3. Abram was still maintaining the faith he had from the first. That's the point. This wasn't the moment, as in chapter 12, when his faith became alive, when he became a follower of the living God. It was not about his conversion, if I can use that word. It was ongoing, everyday faith. That was his stance towards God. And you notice the significance of it. God counted it to him as righteousness. And in this verse, there's a number of big firsts. It's the first time that word righteousness is used in the Bible. It's the first time that idea of counting or reckoning or crediting in the Bible is used. It's the first occurrence of believing or remaining firm. There's a lot of firsts. It's a wonderful statement of the grace of God. It's actually the gospel. Because you don't reckon or count or credit something to someone when that person has it already. You reckon or credit or count something to someone when that person doesn't have it. You open a bank account and money is put into that account and your account is credited or in credit. This verse tells us that God took the decision to look on Abram and count him as righteous even though he wasn't. He was just like us. He was just a sinner like us. And you and I will go out today and God won't fill our lives with, uh, he won't be the, the person who fills our lives every moment of every day because we put other things and other people in God's place. John Calvin called it an idol factory. We make idols and put them there instead of the living God. We are sinners. And Abraham was the same, but God counted it to him. He said, in his heart, in the heart of God, Abram's righteous. And there's an overflow with that. Righteousness isn't something he had himself, but God counted it to him. And the New Testament writers are full of explaining what that was all about. Here's one very well-known passage in Romans chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. 
But the words it was counted to him, Paul's talking about this story, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Do you see, if you're a follower of Jesus today, what God is is doing and saying about you? He's saying, you're righteous. I'm counting you as righteous. You can never be righteous, but I'm crediting to you. I'm giving it to you, and I'm giving it to you because the righteous one, Jesus, took your sin and paid the price for it. And now this is yours. The simplest way I can explain it is this wonderful exchange God takes our sin and places it on Jesus. He pays the price for it. And God takes Jesus' righteousness and places it on us. You're righteous. It's wonderful, isn't it? That's what this verse is pointing forward to, what Jesus achieved on the cross. Why is Abram righteous? Because Jesus died for his sins and God credited to him. Do you get it? So that stops all the idea of trying to meet God halfway, of trying to be a better person, of trying to be a good person, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Me first. I know my sins far better than I know yours. So having said that, do you see the character of faith? This is the last thing I really am sharing in terms of this third point. Many, many years ago when I was a young assistant minister, I went to a house one day and there was a lady there who was a bit spooky, if, if I was being honest. I was a bit spooked by her. And at the end of the conversation that we had, she pulled out this box and opened it up and there were lots of rolled up bits of paper in it. And she said, I'm going to give you a promise today. She had a promise box. I don't know if anybody has. There's nothing wrong with promises boxes, by the way. And she pulled out a promise and it would have been a verse from the Bible. And she said, there, that's your promise for the day. And uh, fair enough. She trusted in the promises, but in actual fact, she didn't trust the Lord of the promises. It's quite an amazing thing. She had a, a little kind of promise each day, and that got her through the day. But she actually told me she didn't know the Lord and didn't need to know the Lord. And I think my life is sometimes like that. I can get through the day because I think I have enough faith. And I know the promises of God. In fact, I even sing the song, don't we, trusting in the promises of God, my Savior. That's an old song. You maybe do it the night of one of the vintage nights or whatever. Um, but we don't trust the promises of God. We trust the God of the promises. Do you get it? Adequate faith is a form of idolatry. Trusting in the promises is a form of idolatry. And I meet people out there who, who do that. Isn't God good? He'll be all right. You hear it on the television. Somebody famous dies. If there is a God, they've gone to be with them. After all, they were a good person. Where's that from? It's certainly not a knowledge of a God who can give us righteousness, the very thing that we need. And without it, we die and we're lost. Faith in Abram's case was not trusting in the promises, but in the promise. And I want our promiser, and I want to encourage you to do that. When your faith seems weak, when you're anxious, think of the track record of God in your life and through scripture and history. Go back to the cross, maybe to the Lord's table, and this is our God. We were singing about it, weren't we? But he would come into a stable filthy floor that he would live amongst people who would despise him and reject him that he would go to the cross purposefully and willingly that he would conquer all our enemies even death itself and rise again and that's where we find assurance isn't it assurance from trusting God and then his promises it's a bit like growing up with our mommy isn't it your mommy says all kinds of things and promises all kinds of things, but in the end of the day, we don't trust actually what she says above trusting her. 
as a little boy, as a little girl, we know our mummy loves us and cares for us and doesn't really have to say very much to us to show that. So, in finishing, let's have hearts that give thanks to the Lord. For just like Abram, the Lord takes trouble to help us keep on believing. And let's simply ask that he will teach us not to fret over the intensity of our faith, be it strong or weak, but convince us that even a weak faith can take hold of a strong Christ. After all, Jesus said, as long as faith is the size of a mustard seed, a mustard seed, tiny little thing, you could just squeeze it out if it is alive it will produce a life that is pleasing to God forever and ever and ever. Let's bow in prayer briefly. Our Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift of faith. Please forgive us if so much of our faith is based on the good things and the good people and the good experiences that we have had in life, and we haven't looked beyond that to the one who has given us all these things. We're so grateful that you're a God of love, of truth, of mercy, of grace. How wonderful it is for any human being to discover that you will credit righteousness to a person because of Jesus' death for us and ask us simply to follow you and to turn from our selfish way and turn to your way. Lord, give us the faith to believe that. And those of us who have come today and feel our faith is a bit wibbly-wobbly, Lord, we pray that this story of how you dealt with your servant of old will strengthen that faith and help us trust in all the more in the God who gives his promises and one day will keep them all. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So let's finish with a, a hymn of faith by faith we see the hand of God. Thank you.
And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.